My name is Jay. Um, I'm an artist who specializes in portrait painting and drawing. And on this DVD, I am going to show you the easy steps um, to actually drawing a portrait. And we're going to go through picking a reference picture, fixing a reference picture, dealing with how to get your reference picture onto your medium, picking the right medium, picking the right tools, and show you an easy way of doing all of that. Uh, portrait drawing this has been a dream for a lot of artists, but it's one of the most daunting tasks if abstract art is one of the easiest art forms there's out there. Portraiture is one of the hardest. Pure because we are, as humans, are used to looking at faces all the time, so we would recognize instantly if there is something off, which is a great discouraging thing for most artists who are actually willing to make that step into portraiture. So within this DVD, we're going to go step by step creating a portrait in uh, pencil. And we will go into further things like eyes and hair step by step by step. So at the end of the, all the DVD, uh, you will be able to at least start with a good foundation of how to start and how to do it. And I guarantee you that even somebody with a little bit of minimum talent and a little bit of effort, you will actually make a portrait that you will see the likeness in it and you will be astonished by the fact that you made this. It's a great gift to give to people. People love getting the, the pictures drawn because it is different than a photograph, although a lot of people who don't enjoy portraiture and call it photocopying, there's difference. We put an emotion in it that a photograph cannot. So we're going to go over the tools and the reference and the mediums and then step by step we are going to draw a portrait. And at the end, this will give you the foundation to start on. Um, it's meant for the absolute beginner, but it's also useful for people who already have some knowledge on it, because I will go in more into depth on the eyes and shading and blending and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's get going and let's get and find our materials to start working with. In this segment, we are going to look at the basic tools that you are going to need to start drawing your portrait. I am not going to bother with paper at this moment. First, we're going to go through all the small pieces that you are going to need. And there's a million of them, but it's not that it's a must. I'm not going to tell you to go out and buy really, really expensive pencils. I'm actually going to go and talk to you through the stuff that I personally use to make portraits like this. And so my whole kit is this. I bought this one years and years ago and it shows. I mean, it's falling apart and this is it. I will take the lid off for you and we can go through it what's in it and what would you need to start out with. First of all, I use standard pencils that I just buy at any grocery store. This is a standard pencil, just a 2B pencil that I buy at the any convenience store will sell those or the dollar store or 99 cent store. They all have these. Uh, this one actually has the little eraser uh, removed. These are fine to start out with, okay? Do you have to use those? No. I have a million and one novelty pencils that you get at the bank or at school or anywhere, uh, anywhere else where you can steal them, borrow them or whatever. These will work too. Some of them are hard, some of them are soft. We're going to go in that into just a minute. So these pencils will work the best. Do I start out with those? No, I don't. When I start drawing, I have invested in one of those. This is a lead holder. It's different than a mechanical pencil. It holds a thicker piece of lead than a mechanical pencil does. It has a little grappling hand that comes out when you push on the end. You stick your lead in there and it holds all types of lead. Um, this is the little holder that goes with it, and um, personally I will use a 9 
page, which is really, really, really hard. We're gonna go in there in just a second, but this is how I start most of my drawings. Then I'll go towards the cheaper all day pencils, okay? The next thing that you will want to use are erasers. There is a million and one erasers out there that people use and that, um, that are good and that are not good. First thing that a lot of people will get is one of those suckers. This is what they call a standard pearl eraser. Okay, these are everywhere and anywhere and they are not good. Do not buy the standard pearl erasers. They will just maul your stuff and, and they are not good. I'm going to show you real quick because this one is dirty. We'll cut this one in half. Okay, so you can see they are usually just pink on the inside. To show you real quick why you don't want to buy any of those is I am going to show you just a piece of standard printer paper. It leaves pink marks on the paper when you erase with them. Okay, don't buy those. These are, are meant for schools. These are meant for anything except drawing. So just throw them away. Don't bother with those. Okay, what I personally use are the E-Pure Mates ones. They are triangular ones. And they uh, they are really, 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 really good. I like those. I buy a few of those at the same time. And I will cut those things up to get a nice sharp point to them. This way, you always have a you know nice clean point to it. Because they are white, you can clean those. Just get a piece of sandpaper if you want. I've got a piece right here. And if you want a nice clean part of it, there you go. Look at that. Look how fast that cleans up. So if you have a dirty eraser that you need to be cleaning because it gets dirty with all the graphite and stuff on it, just sandpaper will clean that right up for you. So this is what you need to be using for that. They're white, they won't smudge on your piece of paper, they won't do anything else. So the E-Pure Mate, I'm not sure if they can get anywhere, but any white eraser will do. The other thing for erasers are needed erasers. These are really, really, really good. They're kind of like chewing gum. Just don't eat them. Um, they are really good for tacking and taking off um, graphite where you, where you want it. And it's also very good for shading and stuff like that. So kneaded erasers or just plain old white erasers is what you want. You don't want to be using anything fancier is what I meant. Um, speaking of fancy, a gift to me, I got a mechanical eraser. It works on batteries and I've used it a few times and they work really, really, really well. Because the little sets come with renewable ones, I actually cut a few straight to a point. When you're drawing portraits and you want to put that little light in their eye, this works really, really well for that. So if you can afford it, I would actually recommend one of those. Um, I've never used it before until just a few days ago. The next thing that we're going to go to, which is still pencils, is 6B pencils. These are soft pencils. Okay. This will probably be the time to start out talking about the differences in pencils and hardness and softness. They are now from hardness to softness. The only thing that you have to remember is, is that H stands for hard and B stands for black. It's soft. So 6B is very soft, 9H is very hard. This is straight in the middle. This makes very fine lines. This is good for mid-tones. This is what we're, we're going to use for shadows. And most novelty pencils, like this one, the one with the ducks on it, is actually all standard 2B pen of 2H pencils. It means that they're still kind of hard because you can write with them, yet they are also very good to draw with for a medium tone. Again, I will take my normal piece of paper, and this is my 9H. You can see that even though it's still soft or hard, it still gives me different 
tones. It's what we're looking for. That's why I bought, if I only put a little bit of pressure on it, I can actually get a very fine, very light line on it. Why do I want that? If I am still sketching and I made a mistake, I can use that to my advantage by using an eraser and getting it ri and get rid of it. Now, this is the standard 2H whatever pencil, HB pencil. Look at the difference, same pressure, look at the difference in darkness. Okay, that is why I always work in layers of three. Okay, light, mid-tone, and for the shadows, I use a 6B. These are, um, they are a brand, I actually, oh, Statler, and same pressure, look how dark that is compared to all the others. So you can clearly see that from light to dark, it's hard, medium, soft. Okay. If I take my eraser, um, my Stormo eraser, and I will go over it just once, you can also see the difference in erasing. This erased everything. This actually left a little bit more. This one hardly erased. So the lighter you sketch with a hard pencil it is easier to erase when you build up your piece of uh, piece of art and our, our portrait we will actually start uh, drawing the portrait with a H pencil so the next step that people use for portraiture are these they come in sticks or they come in pencils I uh, prefer the pencils over the sticks because they won't smudge your fingers as much these are charcoal pencils okay if an H pencil is hard charcoal is the softest you can get there's actually variations in hardness in uh, charcoal as well um, or it will actually say out this was a set this one actually says light which means it's a hard one this one is the medium and this one will be the soft one it's actually a, a Conte pencil so Again, just like in uh, just like in pencils, the charcoal is divided in hardnesses as well. So find what you want. The softer it is, the darker it will be. The most softest that you will get is the uh, the willow bark or willow charcoal. I mean, which is really really soft. If you're trying to do a portrait in paint, that's a good way to start too. But remember, it smudges. There's another difference why I do not like mixing what they call graphite. And charcoal is because graphite has a natural shine to it. Charcoal is dark and matte. So if you mix the two up, you will actually get a, a shiny part and a matte part and not shiny part. So I prefer to stay away from mixing them. You can. There are several artists out there who does that. Um, you could, however, use for parts that aren't supposed to be shiny and you want it really, really dark, like deep shadows. You can try using that. We might actually start using it at the end to see how the end result will look like okay when you get a pencil like these you buy them they do not have a point on them there's the ones that come in the kit there's the ones that hook up to your desk that have a container like this okay there are other ones like these and then there's knives there's the razor knife and there's the box cutter another thing that a lot of people do not think that you can use is, um, this is sandpaper it's a medium grid okay I'll move these to the side for just a second my lead holder they make lead holder sharpeners they go straight in and you roll around like a barrel but if I want to get a nice sharp point to it, this is the way to go. It is better than going around and around and around because you will get a chiseled edge. You want a chiseled edge on your pencil. This works for this really well. For just regular household pencils, any um, sharpener that you can afford will do. This is again, this is a, sta uh, a Statler and these actually came with the kit. 
two different sizes for two different types of pencils. This will make a short uh, point, this will make a long thin point. The problem with these is, is that your point will always be the same. Very long, very tapered, very pointy, very sharp. As soon as you put it to the, to the paper, it'll snap. If you want to take the extra time, take the extra time, get a box cutter, sharpen your pencil like you're wh whittling a stick. Okay? That way your points will be irregular all the time, which is good because it will give a natural flow feeling to your work. This works the same, but it just has a razor blade on it. Um, same idea as the box cutter. Okay? Charcoal pencils cannot be sharpened in a sharpener. I don't know how many times I have to say that. You can see that this one has been whittled before. Don't use a sharpener on a charcoal pencil. It will not work. It will just break off. If it's so soft you end up with just ground stuff. We've gone over that. The next thing, so we've got our, our pencils that we are going to use for the, uh, for the drawing. As soon as I start drawing, We'll go over them again. The next thing that we are going to go over are some extra things that will help you. As soon as you have something like this, you we there's definitely a line between them. There's a few ways of what you can do is to blend them. You can use your finger, and as you can see, as long as I keep going in the same spot, they'll blend. Okay, but it comes on the, on your finger. There's a few ways of doing it. You can use a brush, like that. There's several brushes out there that you can use. Um, but my preferred method are these. This is a blending stump, a rolled up piece of compressed paper that will pick up your graphite and help you blend. As you can see it works better than my finger. Another very important point is that if you use your finger you will get natural grease on your piece of paper. With that it won't smudge as good and you're leaving a layer of grease on top of your drawing which is very hard to work on. So these come in different sizes, they're not expensive. Buy yourself a set and you can actually draw with them too if they pick up enough graphite. You can use them for shading even without putting the graphite down first. These are a great valuable tool. They will last you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Buy yourself a set with a thick one and a couple of small ones and a very small one for the eye. Okay? For the drawing that we are going to do, I'm just going to use this one because I'm so used to it. I'm just going to use this one. Okay? Um, the brushes work the same. You just lightly brush over it and they'll pick up the graphite and blend it. You need a medium to hard brush that'll work and as you can see it works really 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 well. It works the same as a blending stump. Okay, It's up to you. Uh, for larger pieces I would suggest getting a brush because your blending stump is just gonna take forever to do it. So. Just an extra. It is not particularly necessary to go out and buy yourself a set of brushes to use. Um, so it's not particular anything you have to get. The next thing that I use for portraits uh, to start out with is on this DVD I am going to show you guys how to use the grid method. A grid method requires you to, as the word says it, make a grid. This is probably showing it better. These are half inch or quarter inch. Um, these are half inch. Half inch squares to help you trace or transfer the drawing from your reference to your material. I'm going to go into this as soon as we're going to start. This is just a piece of piece of plastic that I have, you can use one of those um, pieces of plastic that goes on the overhead projector, you can use a page protector, this is just Sharpie, it's just something I made so you can easily lay it over something, sometimes you find a picture in a book and you don't want to be drawn over it or making a grid you can use, if you have a photograph you can put it underneath it, 
or you can just print your picture out and draw the grip right on top of your picture. But we are going to go back in that in a further, um, further chapter. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, another extra thing. These are um, rulers. They are necessary just to make the grip. Um, another thing that you can use them for is measuring during your portrait. If you know that your portrait is 4 inches by 4 inches, your reference, and you're making it 8 by 8 inches on your medium, you know that if you measure it, the eye width, whatever, it's going to be 2 times as big. It is handy to have a ruler. This one is just the same kind of idea. It's a ruler that actually has centimeters and inches. It is a, a good tool to have. This one came in a sap. Oh, another very important tool that I just truly, truly love. And these are French curves. French curves are a, a great way of getting all natural curves right. I wouldn't use it at the end. Try using your French curves just in the beginning when you're still drawing and you want to get a nice jawline or you want to get a nice eyebrow or you want to get something like that. The neckline, the jawline are usually quite straight so you can use these for it. They come in different sizes and they come in different brands, whatever. They're not that important which brand you get or don't get. It is more important that you do have at least one, I would say, because they're just very handy to have and you'll be amazed how many times you'll use it. Once we get to the part in the drawing that we can use these, I will break them back out and we are going to use them. One tool that I would say to never ever ever be without is my circle template. Nothing beats a circle template. If you have to do an eye, eyes are always round. Nothing beats a circle template. Um, this one actually has the little dividing marks on them. So you can find the middle of the circle as you go. Which is handy if you want to get the pupil right in the middle. Okay, Just line them all up. And there you go. You got a perfect circle with a perfect circle right in the middle. There is just no way around it. These are the best thing for portrait drawing. Is it necessary? You don't have to. If you prefer to do them freehand, you can, really. But remember, when we get to the chapter with the eyes, I will be using those because it will just look better. Even if it's just a small part of the eye that you can see, it is definitely worth investing in one of those. They won't, they won't break down on you. They won't wear down. This will last you for the rest of your life. I mean, I am a male. I am hard on my stuff. I had this thing for eons and centuries and, and to billions of years. So, just get yourself a basic one and it will last you for the rest of your life. Okay? So, we've gone over pencils. We have gone over how to sharpen your pencil. We have gone over the extra little tools. Um, one more important thing is this thing. It is nothing special. It is the top part that I ripped off of one of those little lap pillowcase thingies. It's just a piece of fake leather plastic, but it's smooth. Okay, if you're drawing, put something down that will not leave an imprint. Cardboard is too soft unless it is compressed cardboard. It is a pain in the butt that if you're drawing and you are, are shading it in and the surface underneath isn't flat, you will see it in it, you'll leave rubbing marks. So don't get yourself something flat and draw on that. Okay, so from here, the next step that we're gonna go through is paper. In this section, we're gonna go and look at the different type of medium you can draw on. There is a million and one thing out there that, as an artist, you can draw on. And there is no wrong or right to draw on. What you have to remember is the there is smooth paper, very smooth, and then there's stuff that has a tooth. Personally, this is the standard printer paper. You get it in rims of 500 for like four dollars. Um, 
it works great. I love it. It's it it blends well. It is cheap. It is tough because it's meant to be handled. So you can actually do a lot to it with the racing and go hard on it with your pencil to actually get a nice dark tone and, and a, a value to it. And then you can still badger it half to death with your eraser just to and it will it will hold it up. So I am actually for this DVD I am using just printer paper. Okay? So there's nothing fancy about that. The reason is is because it is cheap. It is plentiful, it is easy to get and it works. So why would you in spend way more money on something like this. Would I do a commission on it? No, I won't. That's different. But for this class, I'm going to go and do this. Okay? This is illustration board. It is different than poster board. It is. It comes in packages. Um, and uh, this one is actually a package of eight. You can get it online, whatever. Um, it works really, really well. It has a soft side and a side that has a little bit of tooth on it. I like drawing on this because it is already big, it's very smooth, and it's tough as nails. This will actually hold up even better than the printer paper. It's a little bit more expensive. This is the bottom line of a, a good medium, I mean, for doing commissions on because it is it is big, it's, it's reasonable, affordable, and it is very, very, very tough. It takes your graphite really well. It blends great. This is one of my preferred methods to work on. I actually still, I, I, I also paint on this as well. So if you can't afford this, um, if you can't afford this or find it, use poster board. It's semi the same. It's a little less quality. This is illustration board or Bristol board. It's two of the same things. Okay? Or get yourself one of those. I have gone through these a million times for everything. It is, it is. These are great. Would I do a commission on them? No, because look at that. This is why. The paper will buckle because it is just cheap. It's not expensive. It is not worth it. So, I will use sketchbooks for exactly why they're there. They're meant for working out ideas. They're meant for just doing little things. Here's one of my old on a sheet protector. You know, that's not the great thing about it. Just stick it in your book and you're done. So, are those the only pieces of, of medium that you can work on? Definitely not. Um, watercolor paper, handmade paper, cardboard, anything basically that will hold your graphite well. There's a few things I wouldn't draw on. You know, they're just too smooth, like uh, I've, um, wax papers, wrapping paper, stuff like that. Just, you know, you don't want to be going there. Some, there's really expensive papers out there. If you like it, you can. They're pre-colored. They're actually like a medium gray. Strathmore makes just a great sketchbook. They come in all different sizes. I own a few different ones because they are, you know, great to work on. This is my preferred size. It is, let's see, 11 by 14. It is a 60 pound 100 sheets, so they're actually 89 grams. It is just works really, really well. It's uh, quite strong and it will withhold a lot of abuse. Yeah, if you go further with it, it will buckle. So I won't go too far on these. But for again, for the lesson, you can draw on whatever you want. But I am going to use the printer paper because it's an easy size to work with. It's so cheap that if you mess up, crumple it away, and toss it. These are actually a little bit more expensive. As you can see, I've cut the back off. Um, this is good cardboard to draw on underneath. And so instead of one of those brown things that I have here, you can use this stuff that comes on the back of your sketchbook. That's the kind of cardboard I was talking about. So, get yourself a piece of paper. Get yourself something to draw on. Like that, and we can get started. The, the, for a few techniques with drawing and, and stuff like that, we will I, will, I will tell you which paper is actually the best. This has a little bit of a tooth to it, which means that it has, if you feel it, it feels rougher than the printer paper. The printer paper is very, very soft, very, very, Smooth is what I meant. 
very, very, the printer paper is very smooth, which means it blends well, but you cannot dry brush on it. The dry brush technique, I will show you when we get there. This is a little bit more toothier, and it works well too. Um, but this is the lowest that I would go for dry brushing. Um, the toothier your paper, the easier it is with your blending stump to actually grind the graphite in there. But the smoother your paper is, the smoother your drawing will look. Um, the reference that I'm going to be working on, which I'm going to show you right now, this is our end result. Um, it is a lot of blending, a lot of deep shadows, stuff like that. So I prefer to work on a smooth, soft purpose. So, get yourself some paper. Grab yourself the hardest pencil you own. And the next step that we're going to talk about is your reference picture. So, um, um, grab yourself the paper, grab yourself the pencils, and I'm going to show you now how to pick out the perfect reference picture. Uh, in this section of the DVD, we are going to look at reference pictures. Uh, the reference picture is a foundation for the rest of your portrait. It is very hard to draw a really good looking, realistic pencil portrait or charcoal portrait or anything if your reference picture isn't um, a good one. I'm going to show you a few good ones and a few bad ones and I'm going to show you how to position the model if you're doing live drawing um, sessions. The live drawing sessions are always better preferred over picture references because a picture, especially the ones taken with digital cameras nowadays, they are just flat. Um, they, they pick up different colors and they, they, they change around with the hues and the values and the tones in a portrait. So if you have the option, it is always better to actually do a live drawing. But most of us don't. So there's tricks that you can do in any photo altering program. I'm going to show you a few tricks in Photoshop uh, to lighten or darker or darken and to look for the things in a in a reference that you that you need to pick out and um, that actually will make a good looking, interesting, attractive portrait. It is not that you just take any picture and go uh, there you go, unless that's the way. You have to. I mean, sometimes there is just no different, of no other option than to do it. Like with a diseased person, that you know, that's the only picture of fill in blank that they have, and that's the one that you have to work with. But that still means that in Photoshop or in Paint or Corel Draw or any program that you use, there are still little things that you can do about it. And one of the tricks that I'm going to show you is to always turn your picture into grayscale or desaturate it which means that it actually takes the colors out and it turns it into black and white that simple we're going to go over that in uh, the next few steps to show you how to position the model if you have a live drawing model or how to pick a portrait and we're also going to pick out the picture that i'm going to do in the next step because the next step will actually start putting down the grid, explaining what the grid is, and starting to draw. So without further ado, we're going to go and find the pictures that we're going to use, and I'm going to show you the first few steps of picking the perfect reference picture to draw the perfect portrait. Okay, a reference picture. In this section, I am going to show you a few pictures, as the one you are looking at, um, that um, I am going to show you the different types of lighting that people tend to use. As you can see, this one is very, very overexposed. Um, I already turned the picture into a grayscale. I took it as uh, with my digital camera in black and white mode already. I didn't do anything to it except crop it around so you can actually just see the portrait. It is the, my daughter Leah. She's sitting in the chair. She is overexposed. There is only one lamp on her, and the lamp is straight into her face. As you can see, there isn't much um, definition to her face because of the light is so high that it is very hard to figure out the details in her face. 
so this is this will not make a good reference picture we will come back to this picture before uh, after after a while this one as you can see is very bland there is no definition in her face still even though it is not overexposed this one was taken with no direct light on her face there was ambient light there was lights all around her but not directly on her face same position she's looking in the same position the same background just no direct light on her face as you can see it all looks bland and and drab and gray this also will not work for a good reference picture because there's no definition of lines there's no definition of anything um, the uh, there is no uh, planes of shadow to work with which is something that we want to go and look for we want to have clear definition between light and dark between a high contrast is what I meant so we're not going to pick this one as a reference either the next one that I'm showing you now is the spotlight that we had on before that overexposed her is now coming from the left and it is a little bit better than the one that when there's overexposed if we put the two together or right after each other you can see the clear difference that you can you can see the difference between the overexposed one and the one that we are looking at right now it is in the same position the same type of lamp but it is only to one side of her face instead of looking either straight on we can see in the one that is on the left that we have now a clear definition of light dark and medium tones as I have mentioned before, I like working in, in sets of three. A medium, a shadow, and a highlight. This has it. This would be a bare basic minimum of a decent reference picture. Because there is enough shadow around her nose to define the nose. There is enough shadow on her right side, or our right side, her left side of her face, that actually defines her really well. There is enough shadow in the hair that as you can look at the overexposed version on the right, it does not come out well. This one actually does. It has to shine on her hair. It, it is a good picture if you would have you know, put a little bit more effort in it. That would be a good picture. next step that I'm going to show you is the one that we're going to be working with. Um, again, I shall put the other three pictures all together as we can see them right now if we put all these three together in one picture as we have right now um, we can see the difference as to why I have picked this one the overexposed one all the way down to the right it, even though it does have shadow, it puts one eye, her right eye, our left eye, is too dark. There's no definition of pupil. It does not work well. The one in the middle, which is, as we have talked about, the bad basic. We can see both of her eyes. We can see the shadow coming in. It is a good picture. It is not a perfect picture. It's not a real great definition of picture yet. Now, if we look all the way down to the left, this is one we are actually going to use. The part of the hair to, the la uh, to our left, her right, is nice and dark. But, there is definition on top, there is loose hairs in her face, which will break up the monotony of the, of the big shadow on the, side of, of, on the front of her face. Her right side is very nicely... Um, highlighted on her hair both of her eyes are actually looking really well there's definition around the nose there's definition around the lips if you took a look again at the one in the middle there is not a lot of definition around the area between the nose and the uh, and the, uh, the lips so that is why i have chosen the, the outer left one 
as our reference picture. That doesn't mean I'm going to totally forego the one in the middle. There is no rule that says you cannot use multiple references for the same drawing. Matter of fact, the more reference you have from the same subject, the better it is. We are taking the one to the left. Simply because it works the best. Why does it work the best? If you look to her for our left, it's probably the easiest to explain. You can see a clear definition of shadow on the cheekbone and where her cheek for her um, cheekbone is, her cheek and then parts of her chin. There is definitely three spots of highlight. That works the best. It breaks the face up, it makes you look for an interesting plane of view and both eyes are clear, the forehead is broken up by some little strains of hair, the hair is defined well, this is a good reference picture. For now, we're going to look at a video of how to position your live drawing model in this position. Okay, as we can see in this model, the light is coming from her left and you can see the, the clear definition of the shadows around her nose on her left side or our right side, her left side and I'm gonna slowly ask the model to slowly turn to her right so if you could slowly turn but keep your eyes towards us just a little bit there we go okay and stop now we can see that the definition on her le uh, right side for our to the left has gone way dark. There's almost no definition left in her right eye and the uh, left side of her face is totally overexposed. Now we're gonna ask her to do the same thing but go the other way just a little bit. Just a little bit. So if you can turn just a little bit the other way like you were just a little bit more, just a little bit more and a little bit more and stop. Okay, a little bit, a little bit back as you were. All the way. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Stop. Now there we go. This is a classic lighting for a portrait. As you can see, both eyes are definitely in focus. The um, light is hitting her uh, right side, right underneath the eye is very clear and defined so is the part of right next to her nose and most important thing is above her eye where her eyelid is and where her eyebrows are those are very well lit now as well as you can see there's plenty of definition in it and if I am turning the um, the, the colors back on right now you will see that it will actually work really well so let me do that there now we can see how it looks in color um, she's got her head tilted a little bit backwards, but that's we can still see the definition quite clearly of the light above her eyelid and uh, next to her mouth. Um, we can also see in this, if we zoom out just a little bit, we can actually see the purple of the backdrop quite clearly on her face. Um, for drawing, that is not that big of a problem, but for uh, portrait painting, it is actually a good way to remember that the surrounding always casts a shadow. Uh, in the previous pictures, you have seen which kind of types of light um, there is and which type of lighting is actually the best. Um, the light to the side on one corner uh, of her face, that if we zoom in just a little bit more and get the model right back into the position as we were. So if you could keep your head straight and look at the, the lens for me. There we go. Just a little tilt, tilt your head a little bit. Just a little bit that way. And stop. We can get her back into that pose. Um, from here, it is, this is the best way of doing it, just have the model look at one point and have her rotate her head until one part of the face is partially in shadow, but remember the three bits of highlights that we are looking for next to her mouth, next to her nose, and right above the eye. That way both of the eyes are actually still noticeable even though there is light on it. Um, this is the best way of doing it. So now we know how to put a model in the right position, we now know how to pick up the right reference picture. We want to turn this into this. What I've done is I have cropped the picture uh, and darkened it a little bit by going into Photoshop, you're scanning it in, you're using your crop tool to the left if you have your toolbar. 
it is the little one that looks like a black circle um, drag it over the picture of the thing you want now look at the correct picture that I'm showing you right now this is how what we want we want her to be in the middle which is aesthetically very, very pleasing we want a little bit of background and then I am going to use the brightness slider and use that a little bit the brightness is under image in Photoshop uh, image adjustments brightness and contrast if you use that you can make your picture darker or lighter that is what I did I just darken it a little bit because what we're looking for in our reference pictures as I've shown before is we want to have a high contrast between the shadows and the highlights that is what I'm doing with this I also blew up the picture by adding more DPI in Photoshop that is very easily done you go to again to watch image image size and then there's a pop-up that says either inches or resolution because my, my camera takes really big pictures, it's rated tw uh, 20 by 16 inches, but only 72 dpi, which means dots per inch. The higher the dpi in any program of any digital photograph, the higher the dpi, the better the resolution, the more details you get into it when you blow it up. Why is that important? The closer you can zoom in on something, the more detail you can add into a drawing. You would be surprised how much detail you can add to a, to a picture when you're drawing if it's in the reference picture because it's easy to add an extra line that you can't see from a live drawing model that's why more detailed photographs or actually drawings are made from photographs not so much live drawing classes even though I would strongly suggest anybody to do a live drawing class if they can use your family but you can also use pictures okay so now we have figured out what to do. We have cropped it. We can now turn a uh, we're gonna, uh, uh, the picture as we want it. We've cropped it. We've darkened it. Now we have it. So what will be the next step? The next step will be cropping or will be gridding. What is gridding? Gridding is very, very easy. You take yourself the picture that you want and you're going to divide it up in squares. It doesn't matter how many squares, the more you have, the more confusing it will be. To me, the easiest way of um, gridding something up is my original drawing, be it on the computer, be it a photograph, is going to be half inch squares. And I'm going to show you an example of that right now. Right here, you see a sketch I made of just a sketch this is not the start of the drawing the drawing actually looks like this okay once you have that your sketch you divide it up in equal amounts so you end up with a certain amount of squares now we're gonna talk not about inches centimeters it doesn't matter the only thing that you have to remember with working with a grid is that you are working in units if the reference picture has four units by four units the same amount of units will go on your medium that you're drawing on they're not exactly the same size so we can make it bigger or smaller or with the grid with the grid method that's why a lot of muralists and stuff like that who work really big they use a standard reference picture they can grid it up and make the grid as big as they want you have an inch square on your reference picture you can make them six feet tall on your wall and you would still have the same idea okay um what we're going to do now is we are going to use leah here and i am going to grid her up in photoshop because i can't print out the picture so she will look like this once you have this, I'm going to put the same amount of units on my drawing paper that will look like this. And now the actual drawing will start. Okay, we've got our drawing. As you can see, I've got my grid on there. I'm using a little slightly larger piece of paper. Uh, it turned out to be a 10 by 10, so it didn't fit on a standard piece of printer paper. But I've got everything that I need. 
and what we're going to do is I'm going to start using my 9H pencil and I'm going to sketch it all in very lightly. Um, I'm going to start with the eye because I am right handed I'm going to work mostly from left to right so I won't smudge it. Um, I'm not going to worry it too much and as soon as I've got all major details in it I'm going to block out my shadows and then I'm actually going to get rid of most of these little lines that you're going to see. That's the only downside of having a grid is to um, have to get rid of that. So, without further ado, I am going to look at the reference. Here's the reference again. And notice all the little lines that were in there. So I'm going to actually start uh, counting up the little lines. Um, Okay, I know where her eye is going to be, and it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right, this one, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5 down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So within this square, just as your, as your grid suggested, is going to be where her, her eye is. So, I'm actually going to slightly draw in her eye, right there, okay? Now I'm going to just follow it, so I know that, skip one and then go to the other one right there. I know that the other eye is going to be right here. Okay, now if we go same eye, this one, and we know that this square and then this next square is where we're going to be where her nose is, her nostrils. So I'm going to lightly draw those one in too, like that. Okay, now if I go back, one more one right here, I can actually see where her lips are going to be. Her lips are going to be right here, I'm not going to look for anything specific as of yet. I'm just going to block in where things are going to go. And you can see where the lip ends and where it starts and stuff like that by just, you know, um, looking at the lines on your grid. Okay, so now I know where this nostril is. If I can skip one over to this side, I can see on my grid there's nothing there. Over here is where her jawline actually goes. It goes right there. And this is also where her ear is, right here. And I'm gonna go straight up. I'm gonna look where this eye is. And then in the next one over here is where the side of her face is gonna be. Now, the next one is an important one because you can see if you look at the grid again, like here it is, uh, right above the right eye for us, if you look at the adjacent little square right on the right corner you can see that her face ends up right in that corner that's a good reference point I'm going to look for that one okay next up is going to be this one because that's where her hair is now the, the one in between the eyes is empty but if I cut one up two up this is where her eye or her uh, hair part right here. That's another nicely important one. I'm going to go from this eye and look that the next square doesn't have anything but on top of this one actually has top of the eyebrow which is going to be right here and then her hair goes from here to here so that's a nice swooping line that I can put in. This is how I'm going to build up my whole drawing. I'll look for other reference points. If this is her lip I can see that her chin goes right here on the reference point. Her face ends up right here and goes through this one, this square, all the way up. Now I can see another good reference point. If you look at a reference again, I'm going to show you in a second. If you look at her nose and you go over left, then you can see that one of the squares ends up in a corner again. So that's a good one. So I know that it's going to be this one. Okay. So, nice swooping line because she is still a young girl, she's still got a lot of roundness in her face, which is good. So there we go. We got that one in there, and I know that this one is ending up right over here. This is actually where her hair starts going to. So, um, this is where her hair stops, her hairline starts. This is where my paper starts. So, if I go one over and a little bit, I can see that her hairline goes right here. And it goes right over here. Okay, um, take a look.
the one in the corner go over. This one goes in the corner too. So we can easily block that one in too. And then it goes outside to little little squares all the way down here. Now I'm going to pinpoint where her jawline is going to be. So one of the mouth. The next one actually has part of her jawline in it. Uh, they're going to meet right here. Okay. Let's see. Her ear is right here. And her hair will actually go straight down from here all the way down. There we go. And her neck starts at this one, goes down right here. The other one is right here. And her, let's see, there's a shadow going right here. We can put that one in that way. Goes straight from right over to here, right here. There's another shadow. I'm putting those in too. Putting her shirt in like this. So where it starts, it starts. Let's see. Come over here. Putting her shirt in. Her shirt is going to come a little bit off. I have a little bit of cut off right there. And that one goes over there. And remember, we're just still sketching, so we can still change everything up as we go along. So here we go. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna now put in. I'm gonna work on the eyes a little bit more. Still using my nine mini, my uh, nine edge. Okay. Um, I want these to have the right proportion. There is a little trick that you can do. I know that my picture is exactly one time. My reference picture is one time smaller than this. So if I take my circle template and I put that on the reference picture on my computer I can see that her eye is a 4 so if I double that it will be a 8 so I know that my eye will be this big I can also see it barely touches into the um, to the upper line and not quite touching the line to the left so I'm gonna put it tentatively right here okay now I also know that the other eye must be an 8 too, so I'm going to check that out where it is. It is a little lower than that corner, so I'm going to put that right here. There we go. This is where her eyes are going to be, roughly. So, not to get confused, I'll get rid of those. Okay, there we go. As you can see, you know, this is how we're going to build it up. These are just the pupils, these are not the whole round eye. So, now... These are going to be the eyes, the round part of her eyes. She actually has her eyes open quite wide. Um, I'm going to, need to um, switch reference from the one with the grid on it to the one that we're actually going to use, the one that actually has no grid on it. The reason why I do it is because right now I vaguely know where everything is going to be, and I have my reference points. Okay. The grid can be in the way if you make your, your lines too big or too small. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to... You can still use your grid. I mean, by all means, keep it open. You know, if it, if it helps you out more, then there's no law that says you can't. Okay, I'm not going to preach the rules of portraiture to you right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for other little reference points, like big shadows. First what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the eye. The eye goes a little further than this line right here and it goes, the top of the eye actually goes right on top of here. And remember, because it is still a sketch, we can still change it all up. Okay, so there we go. Then there's a big shadow going in right here. She's got the lump on her nose right here. And we go that way. Okay, this all ends right to the to this part of that drawing. So I'm, I'm going to put that in already. The nose, there's always a ball of light right on top of your nose because your nose is roundish. So this is what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm sketching in shadow parts. I'm not putting in all the major details just quite yet. Put in the upper eyelid. This is her lower eye, the, the top part of her lower eyelid goes down right here. Don't have to make all smooth, round 
lines because we, we are still looking for uh, replacing still things. We're not actually going to um, um, put all of those lines in quite yet. Another good thing is we're going to looking for landmarks. Um, because I know that the pupil is always in the middle of the eye, I'm going to use my circle template and roughly put in our pupils. And again, I'm just going to go like this and figure out how big they are. So I have to make it the same size as it is over there. And it is a 2, so it's going to be a 4. Now why I do this, I'm going to show you in just a second. Right there, it's going to be right in the middle. Okay, so I put our pupil in right here. Right here. This is going to be your pupil. You can make that darker if you want. Now, what I, why I did that is because if you look at your reference, you take a ruler and you put it right there where her pupil ends, and you go straight down. It goes like this. Okay. Gotta go up that way. You can see that the shadow over her nose, the big shadow, goes right there. Okay? And it goes up a little bit, and then it goes that way. There we go. So we're already dealing with a few shadow colors. This is how we're going to build up the whole face. I'm just going to look for reference points, and I'm going to look for... Um, for for defined landmarks in her face that makes Leah Leah, and I'm not going to measure things out. You can if you want. You know you you can measure it that if this one is a certain amount of units, then the other eye needs to be exactly the same. You know width. And speaking of that, just to film out there, that when you're doing portraits, there is a standard measurements in there that you can use if you want you don't have to they are they are you know the the there is an eye width between the width the, between the eyes so if i know that you know between that one and that one needs to be exactly this which there roughly is i haven't put in all the shadows and stuff yet so um if you worry about it you can measure it change it up as you go along. There's no, you know, there we go. Okay, so as we go along, I am just filling in shadow parts. You know, there's, I'm working on the part now that actually has not a hell of a lot of shadow in it. So, and as you go along, you can start erasing certain lines that you know you're not going to need, like in her face right here, there isn't a lot of shadow. So I'm already going to take those out. So there we go. Okay, so once we have that, I'm going to work on her lips just a little bit more. I can see that it is barely touching that part. And if you look at the grid, it comes, this line is right here where her mouth is. Goes down a little bit. There's a defined darker spot right there. You can put that in if you want already. And her top lip is bigger than her bottom lip, which is the same with most people. Okay. Um, okay. And up a little bit. Like this. Okay, and again, it's still very, very rough. Uh, I'm not going to go in and, and go all berserk with all the uh, shadows and, and stuff like that. Her chin is right here, which goes this way. And this is also a very good anchor point for shadow. And here comes the part that we talked in, in reference points. There's a shadow, there's a light right up here, and there's a light right so I can 
go this way, and this will be mostly dark. There's a little bit of light shining on this part of her face. I'm going to put that line right in there. And I know that that line is going to come up to straight. Up to right there. Okay, then this part is mostly in, in dark because this part is underexposed compared to the rest. So we have that one. Let's see, the next step would be right up here. And I see that her eyebrow is coming up right in here. Her eyebrow is actually attached to this part. So it will be like this. There's a defined highlight right there, which goes straight in her eye like this. And this part actually goes there. So we know that this is going to be all in shadow. And you can already see that there is a likeness forming. Um, let's see, there is a shadow plane right here that I'm going to put in. And there's one around her nose like this. This one can go closer over here. There we go. And as we go along, this is also the part where we can clean it up. Start making some darker lines as well. Okay, so now we have all the major planes in there. A um, couple of little tricks. There is no reason or rhyme or reason to how to hold your pencil. Some people like to hold it this way for whatever reason. Some people like to hold it whatever. I hold it exactly the way as how I would write because I've been writing longer than I have been, you know, drawing serious. So, for that matter, you know, I, I have more control or I believe, feel that I have more control with it this way than anything else. Okay, so this is going to be a preliminary sketch. Um, there's still major things that, that I can change about it and that I am going to change about it. Um, but this is the major part of where it starts. Right now I am going to not use my grid anymore. I am going to start working from the reference picture that we've got and I am going to zoom in really big onto her eye. I'm going to switch from this pencil to my standard HB pencil and I am going to start putting in the first shadows okay I work in parts of three light medium and dark so I'm gonna put in my, 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 my mid tones right now and I am going to work on the eye first okay there's going to be a, a highlight right here so I will actually draw in the highlight. Don't make the, uh, the eyes completely round. Your eyelid always obscures parts of it. I know I used a circle template. Doesn't mean you can't deviate from it. Okay, so there's a very dark, dark spot right here, which I can hit right now. There we go. Then from here on top of that is going to be the top of the eyelid. Now if you do this really really dark it's going to be really hard to erase so still don't push too hard on your pencil. Okay, This line is actually a nice swooping line going like this. Her eyes are mostly uh, a dark blue so I can color in her eye a little bit. Remember because we're working in pencil I can take it away whenever I need to. Okay, I'm going to add the shadow of that part in her eye and see that this shadow that I put on top of her eye actually goes along her eye. So I'm going to break up my eraser again. Hold that one close. I'm going to use it a lot. Like this. So this way. No. Okay. Now on top of here I can see that, that there is going to be a shadow going that way. And 
this part is actually nicely bowed because that's the part of where her nose is going to be. And I'm going to darken all of this up because I already scratched it in where I wanted it. And because it is my mid-tone, I can technically go all over it. But I'm going to use it quite lightly. Okay, so this part is actually nicely rounded. eyebrow starts right here. This protrudes. This is where the eyebrow is. And there's still a little shadow underneath here, but I don't want to be putting that in because that's actually quite a light shadow. We can put that in later on with the blending stump when we get to that point. Um, let's see. There is a shadow between the eyelid right here. And the biggest highlight is actually quite here, so I can darken this part up a little bit too. Alright, so I'm going to zoom out on my reference pictures a little bit. Still just focusing on the face, not the hair or anything else, just the face. And let's see, her nostril goes right here. Uh, nostrils are always a deep shadow, although they are never black. I do paint them as dark as I can, but they're always a dark skin tone. Okay, so there is a definitive dark space right here. And if you look at it, there is a line going right here. And then you get this part right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this part a little bit. And we're going to use our erasers a lot to take certain parts out and add certain parts with the blending stump when we get to it. So there we go. Okay. Um, there's a very light shadow coming in from over here and over here. Now the lighter the shadow, the easier it is to do it with the blending stump than it is actually to do with your pencil. So I'm going to concentrate now on this eye. The eyes. Even though the bottom eyelid is barely noticeable, it's going to be the same highlight over there than it is over here. I'm going to darken this part and now remember we can always add the highlight back in with our erasers so she has a darker part right here which is actually pointed because that's the corner of her eyelid go over here and add the upper eyelid right here get rid of the original one this is also the time where you can put in um, what they call artistic licenses you know take away blemishes and take away the um, things that most women don't like you can add you know get rid of some wrinkles as you go along from right here even though the hairline is over there there's still going to be hair on top of the um, forehead i'm putting in her lower eyebrow right now okay and if you put your pencil on the side you can hit big spots all at the sun all at the time now before you do that make sure that you get rid of your construction lines first because once you start shading and blending you really don't want those straight straight lines in there anymore so there we go start adding the shadow part in here okay which actually goes around the eye all the way up here and the bridge of the nose like that there we go. I'm going to get rid of a whole bunch of lines because I'm not going to need those lines anymore. They're actually going to be in the way when I kind of start blending the face. So get rid of them now because it's easier to do it now than when you start blending. You'll see you start blending and shaping and adding um, 
pretty shades and pretty pretty highlights in there and then all of a sudden bam that's just perfectly straight line right in the middle of a organic shape which just doesn't work so there we go i'm gonna work now on the left side of her face and start putting in the highlights right here there's a distinctive bow right there right here and from there there's going to be some shadow coming in right there but there is some highlight so i'm going to try leaving that highlight i'm going to draw it in quite lightly right here and i'm going to try to preserve that one there's also one that is very light going in from over here all the way down here okay right to the one that we drew right here and uh, let's see now i am going to see it's became a little bit too sharp so i'm going to make it less sharp she is still very young so there's not going to be very much cheekbone noticeable as of yet so as you can see i'm holding my pencil by the end now because you know, I'm coloring big spots, and I want it not. Uh, if you do it this way, if you hold it like that, you get a little bit more line than anything else. So I'm trying to do it this way. So you hit bigger spots uh, all at the same time. There we go. And there's still lots and lots of things that we have to do, but we're getting there. We're, we're getting really fast. We're... we're uh, rapidly approaching switching pencils again um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start working on the face it's on the hair sorry there's going to be highlights right here and I'm going to draw those in very lightly uh, because they are not exactly as they are on the picture but that's okay because we are using graphite so we can just take it away as we need to and there we go I'm roughly indicating where the, the, the highlights are going to be. Okay. And when we get to the hair, we'll get to the hair, and that's how I'm going to describe how, how I like doing the hair. There's a little bit of highlight right so shadow right here because she does get her cheekbone, uh, the other cheekbone. There's a big one underneath the lower lip right here. There's another one. It makes her mouth, corner of her mouth, kind of roundish. Then there is a lighter one going in right here, which makes her chin round, like that. Then there is another one, there's a highlight right there, and then there's another one going in right here that goes up on that one. We're not going to leave a hell of a lot of the picture actually white gonna have gone back up here by her nose is right here there is a um, where the lips are right here I want to make her bottom lip of uh, her top lip right there her lips are dark so I want to make those darker already then there is uh, the cleft in her, in her upper lip which will go right there and this actually is almost completely encased in shadow and the shadow is going to be rounded right at this point right here and be connected over here because we talked in our reference pictures about the three highlights the rest is going to be non-highlighted so one two three and here we go it roundish so we've got all this part now in and sooner or later we're gonna stop using our pencil all together okay now around the eye there's going to be a darker part right there there's a a little less of a highlight right there and the rest is going to be quite dark so for now we are mostly done with the face of adding in with that piece of pencil. 
Okay, so we've got that one. Now I'm going to use this pencil for a uh, couple of last more times. I'm going to draw in the hair completely. And you can see where the hair is going to be. Because we already sketched that in. Get rid of the construction lines that are still very obvious. And on this part of the hair as well. You know, don't be afraid to flip your paper around. After all, that's where it's for. Okay, so I know roughly where the highlights are going to be. So I'm still going to go over them, but lighter. Okay. Because I'm using this type of pencil and I have good erasers, I can take them out. So I can actually. What I'm going to do right now is color her whole hair in the same color, except where the defined highlights on top are. Try going with the hair and not horizontal. This is what happens if there's something underneath your paper. It actually leaves a mark. Don't worry about it. We can incorporate that later on. Okay, the other side is very dark indeed. So I'm going to go on top to where the highlights are, right here. Try leaving those. Putting a little bit more pressure upon my pencil. Make sure you got all your eraser bits nicely out of the way when you do this or else you end up with a lot of extra marks on it. That you really don't want. And if we look at it, my chair that she was sitting in is right there and right there. I'm not going to put that in the, uh, in the picture because it will probably be too dark. It's just going to be her ear. Um, this is where we left the highlight because this will define where the highlight actually is. That's the shadow is and her face starts. Okay. I am going to make this quite dark. But only on one side. I'm going to leave this one light and this one dark. So just to indicate on where it is. This is kind of roughly where her hair would be considering where it is. Leave a little mark like this and even though I said never do it, I'm doing it very lightly. Get rid of all the little construction marks on the side. Try erasing one part. Now all these techniques that I'm showing you with the, um, the adding in the skin tones and stuff like that works for every, uh, every ethnic skin tone whatsoever. It works for Hispanics, it works for darker skinned, it works for Chinese, it works for, for Asian, it works for all of them. Okay, so a portrait is a portrait, especially in graphite pencil as I am doing it right now. Now don't worry about the little lapsing over thingies right there, we're still, still sketching. There we go. As you can see, my hand is starting to get graphite on it, and you're going to start smearing it and stuff like that. But still, just we're getting there, okay? So I, uh, if you have troubles with that, what you can do is get an extra piece of paper, lay it on top, and put your hand on top of that. So you actually have um, a shelter piece for your hand so you won't smear, uh, smear it. For it. Now we're going to put in the shadows around her face. They're a little bit lighter. First, what we do is we get rid of the construction lines. And sooner or later, the, the grid is only a method for when you just start out. Okay, so once you get more familiar with portrait drawing or any kind of drawing, the, the grid works for any kind of drawing, not just um, portraits. You can enlarge, make anything smaller, copy anything you want with the same method. Okay, here we go. Uh, there's a, a deep highlight of a shadow right here, and then there's one that goes right here, and there's another one that defines where her collarbone is right here. Her shirt was riding up a little bit. I just bought her one, and it was kind of brand new, so there we go. Go in right there. And there's another one in her shirt, and another one. Right there, and 
as you can see, we've only been at this for a little over half an hour and how far you already got into it. Do the top of the hair, right here. There we go. Okay, so we have most of this pencil. It's mostly done. Now I'm going to start using my six Bs. Those are these two. Now, as you can see, I use these a lot. That's why they're short and stumpy. Sharpen them well. So now I've got my 6B, and we're going to use this thing right now. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a an extra piece of paper. And as you can see, without doing anything with it, you can see it already has graphite on it. I'm going to keep this to one side, like this, and um, by reference, I'm going to zoom in on the eye and make it big, 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 big. This is where we're going to add the details and such. My reference zoomed in nicely big. As you can see, it still kind of looks bland and, and kind of flat. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to start adding in the darker and darker parts. And as you will see sooner or later, this the, the portrait will come alive because the whole trick of it is the play between dark and light and light and dark. And as soon as you understand how those work, it uh, the trick will become easier and easier. There we go. And because this pencil is so small, I'm actually holding it to the side because, you know, that's the only way I can actually, like, properly still hold it. I am also going to darken up shadows. And because it is a 6B, or this is actually, yeah, this is a 6B, um, you're going to end up not having to push hard enough or harder to actually get enough graphite on the piece of paper to get a nice dark spot okay I'm also gonna do now and define the two shadows around her nose that are actually broken up by uh, a darker and a lighter part so I'm doing that now as well and don't worry about obvious transitions between because that's where the blending stump is gonna come in in a second it's also a very dark one right here and I'm gonna add that one too because it will come straight from right here, straight over there. That's one of her hair. Okay. Uh, the other uh, ear, or eye, sorry, is actually quite uh, overexposed. So I'm going to use that one. Now I'm going to use this part to get the highlight back into her eye. And over here too. There we go. That's where they are really good for. So we've got that one in there. Now I'm gonna darken the iris or the pupil. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. There we go. And we're gonna put in the top of her eyelid right there. There we go. We're gonna start making the pupils darker now. Or the, the nostrils darker and adding a little bit more definition to the shape. They are distinct shapes. There we go. Now we can always lighten those up because the darker they are, they actually start looking kind of weird. Now we're gonna um, use the landmarks that we have to start adding in. Uh, the, the, the finding our reference points in there. So I know that her mouth is going to be right here. And there's actually quite the little shadow right next to it right there. And then there's another one going out right there, which is around this way. And her mouth is going to go has the darkest parts is right here. And then it goes lighter as where the light will hit it. The other part that I can now add in is this part which is her mouth 
And I'm going to skip certain parts because I'm going to make those darker as I go along with uh, my blending stump. And the trick in most drawing is, is know what to leave and what to add. Okay. So there we go. I'm not going to completely color in the mouth of the pencil because the lips are a very soft tone. We're going to do that with the blending stump. So we've got that eyebrow in. This eyebrow is a little bit darker still, but not too much. Okay. Let's see. Now this part of the shadow is an important one. Um, there's a very deep, deep shadow right here. So I'm going to add that one. That's the one that we just drew in when we went and zoomed all the way in. Um, the part goes up right here. And then it goes over here, bows down, and goes over here. And again, I'm going to leave that little highlight right there and start adding the darker parts, which is as clo is closer to her face right here. Believe it or not, this part is actually lighter, so I'm going to add those. And then just use a little less pressure when you go this way. And even though it's darker, it's still just graphite. Okay, so we've got that one, and now you already can see the play starting to, to form between the two. One is right around here. Her hair comes in right here. There we go. And then there's a couple of strands going up right there. But there's a big spot, a big dark spot right here. Oh, he's dip of her top of her ear right there. Okay, so there we go. Now we're going to put all those in with the blending stump. We're not going to put a lot of uh, definition in with the pencil. And I'm going to dog her this part in because it is a dark spot. There's a light spot right there, so I'm roughly going to rough that in. So it will meet right there. And the more you go over the same spot, the lighter or darker, you can define it as you want. You know, make sure that this isn't completely straight. It's both because it's hair. It goes one way. So. Here's her ear. Okay, there you go. I'm not going to put all the definition in the, in, the, in the hair as of yet. Okay, what I am seeing though is that there is a big um, shadow coming in right from her shirt right here. Now the trick with a good auto portrait, uh, another good trick is that you don't want to over go overboard with the um, the shirt. If you put in a a, a nice face, you don't want to go and add a very detailed shirt because it will take away from the contrast. Okay, her other ears right here. I'm skipping that part. Coming in right here. Because I know where this is going. There we go. And this might require one or two more swoops of going over it. Okay. But again, because it is graphite I can always go back and take it away, at least parts of it, and that's how I'm going to do the hair. That's my way of doing, there's a couple of ways of doing hair that I will show you in just a second. I want it nice and dark, because I need that contrast towards her face. your time no need to rush it there we go okay so we've got this and now I'm going to do basically the same with the background because we already put a layer of graphite down it shouldn't take that much I'm going to make it a little lighter than her hair 
but still dark red on the other side. So, let me go through this. So we prop that one. I'm going to leave this part. Come back there in a second. I'm going to part and, and uh, look at her hair and add the darker spots. Because I only use one part of the pencil, I've got a brilliantly sharp point to it. There we go. Add this one. over here just you know don't draw what you think you know draw what you see because what we know isn't always right okay. there now most of the pencil work is actually done what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take my blending stone if I can find it right here blending stone is I'm going to take some graphite, the darkest I've got, and add a lot of it to one part. Okay. The reason why I do this is because now I can pick it up where I need to. Okay. This doesn't mean we're completely done with our pencils, not at all. Okay. But what first one I'm going to do is I'm going to clean it up my blending soap just a little bit because I don't want to add too much graphite to it. Make sure that you don't stick your hand on it. And I'm going to start blending shadows. And when I'm doing it, I'm going to start adding the darker spots first, right here. This way, my blending stone will actually pick up graphite. And I'm using this kind of motion on it. And this kind of motion on it. That's why when we're adding, uh, adding shadows, Leave a little extra playing room with the uh, between the shadows, so you can always overshoot just a little bit. I guess there's a need to be a little bit of a neutral zone to it. There's that one, and there they. And now uh, you can see I'm drawing with the blending stone, just pure with the graphite that was on it. Okay, now and if there's too much graphite on it, just take your white piece of uh, clean paper and go on it like that. You can actually take a uh, eraser as well if you want and erase your erase the stuff that's on your blending stuff. Now what I'm going to put in the shadows that are actually defining right here. So what I can do is I can pick up some graphite by just blending on what you got. Look at that, okay? And because it is soft, it will still hold a nice point. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to add a highlight of a, a shadow, excuse me, all right, here, that I didn't put in the first time, okay? I'm also going to add the shadow that's on her eye, which is a dark one. The darker you want it, you can always still use a pencil to darken it up. Just darken it up a little bit with my pencil. 
You can actually still go over it after you blended it. Okay, make sure you got the right spot. Okay, so there we go. Getting closer and closer to the highlight. And if it gets too dark, just take your eraser and instead of going like this, just tap it. This is where a needed eraser would come in handy. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to use the same blending stump without cleaning it. And I'm going to add the midtone shadow. Still using the same circles. I am actually using this to draw a D. Uh, Mid tone shadows. As you can see, just leave the white for the highlight. Okay. Do the same thing here. And there's a darker one right there. There we go. We go over her eye because her eye is dark blue. And there we go. There we go. Now I'm going to use my blending stone. Oh, the other side. There we go. Just left graphite on it. And I'm going to blend in her lips. Like this. Okay, this will give them a soft approach. And I'm just, same thing with a pencil. If you press harder on it, you'll get a deeper shadow. Use that to and pick up some graphite when you need to. Graphite when you need to. Okay. And just go around hitting shadows. There we go. And go back in and blend them all in. Just leave the highlights alone when you're doing it. Yeah. Make sure you look at your reference points plenty. Very important. Look at them as much as you need to. And I'm going to start putting in the biggest part as her forehead right here. Always keep it to one side. So you won't get cross marked. It's easier to take it off. But you still don't want it too dark to begin with. There we go. And there's a part of the nostril right there. And she's got that part right there. Okay. Uh, there's a darker shadow, this one. I'm going to start putting that one in right there. Okay, so now I'm going to add something at this part. And there is a very light one going over this. Even though it's still the lighter part, there's still parts in it. Okay, this part I will start using my finger because I'm not going to go over it way more anymore. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this part and I'm going to add a lot of graphite to it. I guess. What I'm going to do the hair. Let's see if I can zoom in on right on the hair. I'm going to take my blending stump and I'm going to completely cover it in. Picking up all the graphite from the other parts. And the outside of the hair. There we go. Hair can be the trickiest and tedious thing out there. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Because right now we have two of the three things that we want. We want a highlight 
a mid-tone and a deep shadow. We've got a mid-tone and a deep shadow. I'm going to take my 6P pencil and I am going to start adding more and more shadow in it. Because it is very sharp, it makes nice sharp lines. Try going straight in one go instead of in small little turns that I'm doing. Try going nice swooping motions. Look at your reference a lot. Look as, as much as you need and more. Every couple of seconds, for sure, you have to look at it. Don't assume that you know how it looks like. It is better to look more often than working on a certain area and then figuring out that it completely looks like tribe because you really, really weren't paying attention. A couple of loose things like that. And now comes the trick. We're going to use any type of eraser. And I'm actually going to use my electric one to bring back the highlights. And I am drawing with the eraser. I'm going little slow, 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 slow slaps. That's what you want to do because if you go too fast, you end up taking too much off or too little off. And it's easier to just uh, take it easy, take your time to go in and do it. As you can see, it adds highlights real quick. This only works with these type of erasers for small, small details. You don't want to be going over the face because chances are that it's just not going to work. There we go. Now if they're too light, use your finger and go over them again. And they actually turn darker. Remember, you can always add stuff more to it. Okay, let's see where else. Right on top of here, I have to darken this part up way more. So that part of the hair is dark. That's how I do hair. As you can see, there's shadows and highlights. Here's is a close-up of the eyes. So I'm actually going to add some more graphite to this part right here and because I am mostly done using the pencils I am going to start using my fingers or use a paper towel just stick your finger in there and start blending it around Look all the graphite that it's picking up. We can use that because her shirt isn't white. So I can start coloring the shirt with it as I go along. And adding the little highlights around her face and stuff like that. There we go. Okay, so. Again, I'm going to start using my electric eraser and adding in the highlights on top of her head. And as you can see, slowly, but slowly, 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 your portrait will come to life. Okay, and just at this point, the only thing that is left is to go ahead and blend 
at takeaway, blend some more at and take away. This technique with the grid and with the the parts of dark and light and shadow work for all types of skin tone and, and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm gonna use the stone pen to finish it up. Here's the shadow underneath her face. On the shirt. Use my finger that still has the graphite on it and just blend it in. We don't want a, a lot of definition in there, but we still want to be see that it's got white spots just as her face. That's what I'm going to use with the eraser and bring that back in. The eraser is just a good enough tool to draw with as any kind of pencil there is. And then blend the edges. There we go. I'm going to use my graphite piece of rag and go over the side that I want the light part to be. Long strokes. blend it in. These work really well for big areas like this and if you take a clean part you can take it off too. Okay, I'm going to use my eraser to take certain parts off that became too dark. Only too much over here. Bring it back to highlight. It's one of it's the most important step. We are now at the later stages of drawing a portrait. We're cleaning it up. Still as important as anything else. Yeah, it is. It is one of the few la uh, later steps that we're doing. It's a very rewarding step because at this point you already put a lot of effort in it and you want to see results and this is this is the area where you're going to get results there we go let's go a little bit over here all right now i'm going to take my normal pencil again and i'm going to start adding the little hairs in there see where they come from determine the point of origin where it starts and where it goes Try doing it in one nice motion. And if you have to hold your paper at an angle to give yourself enough swooping room with your pencil, by all means, go for it. Most important, draw in a position that makes it the most comfortable for you. I'm gonna add in a little bit of highlight of uh, shadow. There's a couple of hairs coming down right here that actually form a, a shadow. There we go. And there's another one coming together right here. It's got quite thin wispy hair, so I'm gonna add those in there too, like that. out some more details that that I forgot the first time around like adding extra definition to the eye there's a shadow being cast right there and at this point the only thing you have to do is you are mostly done the only thing you have to do is go in and find the areas that are important as I said I don't gonna pay a lot of attention to the shirt Portrait's gonna get cropped anyway when you um, when you frame it. So I am gonna take my thing of graphite and load up my blending stump some more. And darken this spot and darken this spot. As you 
can see you've you've got a few steps how easy it is to get started now is this the way of doing it is there no other way no there's there's millions of ways of doing this I'm just showing you the step that you will might need or might enjoy to get around the big learning curve that there is in Porter drawing. There we go. And we are done drawing where there's really dark spots. You could try using charcoal if you want to. Um, I'm going to show you that um, you can will mix but I am not a big fan of doing it because graphite has a um, a shine to it as where charcoal is dark and has no shine to it okay as this is my charcoal pencil you can go over the darker spots if you want but you will find sooner or later that they will start becoming too dark and that's not what you want so are we done? no you can tinker with this one for hours and hours and hours go in and, and find yourself all the details that are in there and that's the fun in, in portrait drawing you can go and stay and, and draw the same portrait for a long time I, I will scan this one in. Another very important thing is to always sign your work. It's important that people know who made it. And we are basically went through all the steps of drawing a portrait. What we're going to do now is recap it and then we are done. Okay, we have come to the end of our DVD lesson. Um, we went from step to step from basically knowing nothing about portrait drawing or even just knowing the basics to getting a complete and good looking portrait. I've given you the basics, this is by far not the end result that you can get. Practice and practice a lot and you will actually definitely get better. Um, there is a million and one things that you can do that won't fit on this DVD. Um, the most important thing is, is to don't be afraid of the deep shadows. Make them as dark as you can because there is no color in it but just a deep, deep shadow. The deeper the shadows, the, high, the lighter your highlights, the more contrast you'll get between them. Um, when you're doing a live session, make sure that your light is as I have told you. And there's a good trick that when you're using a model, Tell them that you stop drawing for a second and look at that moment when they relax. That is the moment you want to remember and draw them as. They won't give you the smile, they won't give you the fake smile, and they won't give you the awkward pose that some models will assume because of the rigidness that have been put in. Another good tip is that try to take a picture of people in a natural position. Don't force them to smile, don't give all the teeth because the teeth will... Is, is, one of the hardest things to draw in a portrait. Um, if you do end up with one, draw them as light as you can, with as less de uh, detail in it as you can, because if you draw every lingle, a single teeth with the shadows in between and all of that, they're going to look like a retinac that actually has no teeth left in their face. So don't do that either. Make sure that you get a good reference picture and that you got a comfortable spot to work on, something that doesn't strain your back and have fun with it that's the most important thing thank you for sharing this all with me and i'll see you guys soon